What is going on? Welcome back. Third and 20 podcast, episode 31. My name is Frank Entwistle. We've got the co-host, the man man himself, Ryan Steed. What's going on, Ryan? How you doing? Going good, man. It's playoff week. Time to grind. It is indeed playoff week, but let's get started with the episode. We are going to be taking the floor again. And for this week, I am going to be talking about with the season starting to wind down. Um, I kind of alluded to to it on my last take the floor and that is how to use the combine and the pro day and all this extra jazz in your evaluation of prospects or at least how I have done it and I found it to be somewhat successful in my self-scouting and that is the first thing you have to do is identify issues you have with a prospect from watching them play. So, for an example, Javante Williams, I have as one of my problems, I think that his lateral elusiveness, agility, his quickness, his lateral quickness is better than his vertical quickness. What I mean by that is that he he is faster, he is more agile going horizontally left and right than he is getting up the field vertically. And when it comes to the combine... I am going to check, okay, what is his 20-yard split in the 40-yard dash compared to the other running backs? And, okay, what about his three-cone time compared to the other top running backs? And that will give me some insight onto how quick, how agile he really is in these departments, right, In, in these areas of his game. And while it's not a complete steadfast rule because these guys have shorts on, not shoulder pads on, it's something that I identified in his game that I want to see how he is physically compared to other prospects. And I think that that is how the combine and the pro day and all this stuff should be used. Instead of saying and looking, oh, well, this guy, he ran a 4-3-4-40, which is faster than this guy's. 4-4-2-40, Four four two forty. So instantly, this guy that is a four three four has an edge over the other one. Because if a player is playing slow on the game in the game with shoulder pads on, you know they could be the fastest guy in the freaking world. But if they don't know where to go or the most efficient path to take, and they don't manage the space on the field well, they can play slow even though they test fast. So I just wanted to give a quick PSA with an example that I was going to use on how to use the combine, how to use pro days and all that jazz in your analysis of, of, of a prospect, because with dynasty fantasy football getting way more popular, this is something that I have had to learn by just evaluating prospects for the past five or six years and something that I have had to improve on. So I will share my limited knowledge to you in this department and just an area that I feel I've had some success with some prospects. All right. So uh, my take the floor segment is on the uh, chargers firing Anthony Lynn. And I want to applaud the chargers franchise for canning Anthony Lynn. We've talked about him multiple times that we don't think he was the guy to get the job done. Clearly not ended on a hot note with a uh, four game winning streak, which, you know, we've seen some teams in the past, retain their coach if they start to figure things out late. Uh, I can attest to this personally as, you know, they could have gave them the Dan Quinn method, you know, uh, have a good team, have a little higher expectations, and then finish at 7-9, and nine, but you finish strong, so you give them one more shot. Listen, Anthony Lynn hasn't really done anything for this franchise, and they made the playoffs once, I'm pretty sure, and really nothing after that. He – and his major fall was, you know, he couldn't win ball games. And even though they got on a hot streak in the season, I still think that would have been imperative moving forward. And also, the Chargers, I think, saw the um, attraction that Justin Herbert brings. Justin Herbert would have won Rookie of the Year regardless if Joe Burrow got hurt or not. He put up historical numbers as a rookie and looks like he's a true hit in his first round pick. So the job opening should bring tons, tons of 
great head coaches calling as, you know, now like you look at it, you really are in the driver's seat of who you want to get. And, you know, I think Anthony Lynn would kept, kept like held you down, kept a chain. So now they bring in, if they bring in and get the head coaching right, which they should, because they have every shot in the world, this could take a team to like above and beyond. I think of it like a, not because Jeff Fisher deserved to be fired with the Rams. And I think he went like four and 12 the last year he went, but you saw like with a young quarterback and the, Sean McVay saw there was something in golf. They were able to get a guy that has just been a great head coach in the, in the NFL. And you see the Rams, they compete year in, year out. They've been to a Super Bowl. And I think the Chargers, with the talent on the roster and with Justin Herbert, they can get that coach that will excel them to that next level. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the whole thought process to it was too like, you're going to be having to face Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs for odd some years. And you know Justin Herbert is your guy. So you have to get a guy that compliments him well. And now they're able to take full advantage of it. And I'm really looking forward to who they hire. Because it may be the Bills OC. I, they got to be him running with some more top head coaches. And 2021 could be a really big stepping stone for this Chargers team. I saw um, – I'm pretty sure they were interviewing Jason Garrett as a possible oh. head coach. Oh, Jason Garrett. Okay. All right. Well, real quick, I know that Jason Garrett is a bit of a meme. That's kind of what happens if, if you're the coach of the Cowboys. Like, now Mike McCarthy is taking that role on. And, you know, if you're not winning games with the Cowboys, you get crapped on just about more than anyone. Um. But, yeah, I think you're right. Do you have the Chargers as the number one destination right now for head coach? For me, it would be. Uh, you could argue Texans because of uh, Deshaun Watson, but I think I would take Herbert uh, just a little more young. And also I think the uh, Chargers roster has a little more talent than the Texans do, so maybe it's not as much rebuilding there. You know, you ha- like you bring in a nice head coach with a good um, – scheme around Herbert and you have a good draft. I mean, you could honestly, and maybe a couple free agent signings, you can see this team in the playoffs next year. The Texans like with Deshaun gives you a shot, but I think there's more to rebuild there than there is with the chargers. All right. So last Sunday we had the last football games of the NFL season, which included the Sunday night football game number 256 between the playoff hopeful Washington football team and the nothing to play for Philadelphia Eagles. And it was a good game for most of that game, right? Up until I would say that fourth and five in the late in the third quarter, Eagles down three, and they go for it. They go for it. They they want to score a touchdown. You know, fine. You know, it's last game of the season. Um, you want to take the lead. You want to get some momentum for your players. I can see that. I can totally see it. You know, they're according to the data analytics, you had a five percent better chance to win by going for it. I don't know how that makes sense in a defensive football game when you're down three. But regardless, hey, up to you. But then the next drive. They bring in Nate Sudfeld, and that got people really up in arms, and rightfully so. We had heard rumors before the game that the Eagles and Doug Peterson were going to try and get Nate in the game. And, you know, the execution was kind of poor, because at that point in the game, it's a close football game. Jalen Hurts is he's not playing well, but he's making enough plays to keep you in the game. Um, mm. and then you bring in Nate Sudfeld randomly in the fourth quarter after you went for it on fourth and goal. It just it was really a head scratcher. And you know, that just brings the question: were the Eagles tanking that football game for a better draft pick? To be honest, I think they were. I honestly think they were. There's no way that you can argue. There is a way. 
But I, I find it very hard that you can – the Eagles were legitimately trying to win this football game because there was really no clear plan for how they were bringing Sudfeld into the game. You, they just decided randomly – down three points with the last quarter, take it or leave it. We're just going to bring in a quarterback who hasn't played in three years. Yep. You know, I, I think first off, if, if we're going to, for the people to argue that they didn't tank, because I can see it now after a couple of days, I've cooled off a little bit. I could see it because, you know, you want to, you want to see, I guess what you have in a guy, but he's been on the roster for three or four seasons. He's a sixth round pick. It's like, what do you need to evaluate on top of the fact that the guy that you are now deeming the franchise quarterback has only played three games and has a 52% completion percent. And you're just going to deem him the starting quarterback now for next season over Carson Wentz, who, yeah, he played like shit this season, but I at least know what he is. Yeah, I don't think that they should bring him back, and you can't anymore because you completely ruined that. But regardless, the jury's not out on Jalen Hurts. It, I think it's a little bit rash to say that he's a franchise quarterback after a handful of games, which, you know, he, he beat the Saints without Drew Brees, where the Saints didn't score a point in, in the first half, and the Eagles still almost blew that one. I mean... You really you saw flashes, but you didn't see the whole picture. And it's like, if you were bringing in Sudfeld into the game, why not just bring him in for a half or or start him or have some sort of okay before the game? We are clearly announcing, hey, Nate Sudfeld is going to be playing at some point. You were just hinting at it. Ah, you know, we're gonna try and get Nate Sudfeld some some snaps. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. That didn't look like – that looked like you were forcing Nate Sudfeld some snaps. And to be honest, I really feel bad for Sudfeld for the situation that you put him in. Just the guy hasn't played in three years. You're bringing him in cold in the fourth quarter up against a stud defense, probably the best defensive line in football right now, with an Eagles offense that we all know has a ton of problems, including mm -hmm. their dog shit offensive line. For a quarterback that is – that. Cannot use his legs for the most part. Yeah, if if there's no one within 20 yards of him, he can. But he's not Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts is a mm -hmm. mobile quarterback. Nate Sudfeld is not a mobile quarterback. He was a sixth-round pick. He is a pocket quarterback. You need an offensive line for him to succeed. So what are the takeaways? Let's just, let's just get into the takeaways, right? What are the takeaways? It's a big fuck you to the players, to be honest. Mainly, too, the two quarterbacks, we already mentioned Nate Savo, but also Jalen Hurts, taking him out of, out of the game in what I believe would have been his best win if he was able to pull it out. Sunday night football, division rival, able to play spoiler. That, at, that defense was playing better than the Saints defense was a couple of weeks ago. Saints didn't have Drew Brees. They didn't score a point in the first half. It's not an impressive win. They almost lost it. Yeah. This would have been his best win. And it's just a big fuck you to, the, to all those veteran players in the let, let me let, let me tell you this, Steve. Imagine only a handful of years ago, if I told you right after the Eagles win the Super Bowl, that we would be here now, that Carson Wentz gets a hundred even the beginning of the season, Carson Wentz gets his hundred and thirty million dollar extension, right? Everything's looking good. You're getting a bunch of guys from injury back. You still have guys like Jason Kelsey and Ertz and Goddard's looking good. You pick Rager. You know, the defense is looking looking all right. Not in the beginning of the season, but towards the middle of the season, it was getting good. And what if I told you all of a sudden, in, within one season, Carson Wentz is demanding a trade. You finish last in your division with the only team with a returning head coach in a COVID year. You are now deeming... Jalen Hurts as your franchise quarterback playing three and three quarters games and you have now have players like Miles Sanders coming out and, and, and questioning the head coach's decisions. Mm -hmm. Can you even fathom that? <laughs> like, is that not crazy? Am I the only one that's like, what the fuck happened last night? 
Yeah, no, especially like from the Super Bowl standpoint, because you would think the Eagles were ready to go. Like they win the Super Bowl with Nick Foles, you get your franchise quarterback back, and you're just like, okay, we're like, we know Wentz is better than Foles. Like we can do this, we can win it. And just the train wreck, especially this season, they've gone down. And to end on that note, it's just, it, I think it's disrespectful, especially the players. It's, terrible for the fans and i just think they really just sold out you know no i completely agree because he you know i mentioned those other problems with the players and all that but the two biggest problems i have with this are mainly just around the trust right because i was a guy i had doug peterson ranked as my 10th overall coach in the beginning of the season when we ranked our top 10 coaches howie roseman is a general manager that while he's been a little bit shaky with his draft picks i like the guy i thought he really he was a good guy to to lead the eagles right jeffrey lurie their owner i thought was one of the better owners in the league you know, I really thought that this Eagles organization was set up for success with their management. But the big problem is, and it's I don't think it's as much incompetence from their management as it is just a bad decision. People make mistakes, and I think this is a big mistake in that it it took years, right, for this for this organization and this team to to build up this trust with the football team, to get the culture to where it is. You know. And that's through practicing what you preach, you know, preaching to the players, hey, play to the last minute, play all 60 Mm -hmm. minutes of the football game, play, give me everything you got. You know, you have to buy in. Well, the staff this past game just said, oh, you know, we don't have to do that. Just you guys have to do that. We don't have to buy in for every game. We don't have to play all 60 minutes. We would rather get better draft picks to replace you guys than, than win with try and win and improve with what we got. Because clearly you guys aren't good enough. Mm-hmm. And th- that whole thing, it, it takes so long to build, but can be fractured it like that. And I am really scared for this Eagles football team that they may have just broken this culture that might take a couple years to now fix this could be something that has a lasting impact. I do think that some people in the media are overreacting. It's not like, you know, the Eagles are going to be screwed for years to come. A lot of these guys on their roster aren't going to be there next season. Guys like Alshon, Jeffrey, and whatnot. But you're, you also might be losing great, great players and great coaches. Jim Schwartz is already leaving, and rightfully so. He said he was going to probably yeah. take the year off before the game. And, yeah, why would you stick around for this dumpster fight? You know, your defense mm-hmm. is playing well, but you're losing games. Screw that. I would I wouldn't stick around either. And it's like the last thing is, you know, so it, it, from losing, you know, you move up from nine to six. You gain on the Jimmy Johnson trade value chart that a whole lot of people have popularized mm-hmm. now. You gain about the 64th or 65th pick in the draft in terms of value from moving up from nine to six and moving up your second round pick and the other picks that they have. You gain about a a late second, very early third. But at what cost? Is it really worth losing or potentially losing? I'm not going to say losing because I I doubt they're actually going to just straight up lose the locker room. But you're not going to have that trust that you you would have had otherwise. You know, I think that after that game, players will not look at this management the same. They'll still buy in. But are they going to mm. buy in at just 90% or are they going to buy in at 110% like you really need? And and then you just yeah. look at their previous draft success too. Uh Marcus Smith, 2014, Nelson Aguilar, 2015, Wentz in 2016, the only pro bowler, all pro caliber player they've really taken in the first round of the past six seasons. Derek Barnett, decent player. He traded out in 2018 that was Lamar Jackson. 
Andre Dillard, who I like, but he hasn't played in 2019, and Rager in 2020. Maybe it's not about the picks, and it's about the coaching and development and the guys that you have now. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point because we look at their Super Bowl team, how much of them were from, like, Petersons and that staff, like, picking the players, and more just, like, from previous and free agent signings. It's not like they're hauling in these talents and competing, you know. And I just can't get over, like, going back to Jalen Hurts. You know, you, you take this guy in the second-round pick, you bench Wentz to start him to see what he's got. Fair point, right? And ultimately, if you believe in this guy, why are you benching him late? I don't care if you want to see what you have in Nate Soulful. I think that's an excuse. I think they only said that just to just say, like, at some point in this game, we're going to throw the game because we're not going to win with Nate Soulfield. You know what you have in Nate Soulfield. You like he's six round pick. You've seen him in practice. He's he hasn't played in a while. There, there's no way this guy's going to come in here and light it up and be like make you question: Is this our guy? I can tell you right now. I could have told you when he was drafted. He would never play. He would play like two games in his career, barring injury. And I, I just can't get over that. Like I, and it comes back to the trust things with the players, you know, like Miles Sanders says he didn't agree with uh, benching Jalen Hurts and Miles Sanders, I feel like was very undervalued this year. He was banged up, but didn't really was able to utilize his talent just because of how bad the offense was. And I really think this off season, the coaching staff has to take a look. Cause like, yeah, you know, if they truly tanked, which I think they did, they, they succeeded by getting the six pick. And but like you look at the players they're going to be picking, you know, like I could if I got picked by the Eagles, I could kind of think to myself would be like, well, yeah, I just got picked here, but can I trust them? I mean, is this a franchise I, I can truly trust and and win games with? If worse comes to shove, like they're ready to ship you off and bench you, you know. And I think that's up for question too. Yeah, you know this this was not a team resting their starters for the playoffs Mm -hmm. because even those teams try to win games. This is not Greg Williams calling a zero blitz at the end of the game because he was held accountable. See a single Eagles coach that was fired after this game. This was a tank job and this was a tank job at the expense of the players playing the first time we have ever seen this. We have always seen GMs tank. We've always seen players being held out that could play, right? But we have Mm -hmm. never seen a coach actively make decisions without winning in mind. And if if they did make that, like Greg Williams, where he had his ego over winning, he's fired that day. Literally 30 minutes after the game, 15 minutes after the game, he was canned. He was held accountable. And the thing about the tank job, you know, if like you do it on Sunday night football, everybody's watching. Like everybody wants to see if the football team wins this game and gets in. That you do it on national TV, yeah, it's it's going to get blown out. Like I don't know if it gets the same media attraction if it happens on like one o'clock. But like you know, I I feel like if the whole world's watching, everybody's going to pick up really quick, and I just wouldn't do it. You know, like I'm also been the kind of guy like just. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm 0 and 15 or 15 and 0. I'm going to try to win the damn game. Like, but clearly to them, they don't care. And uh, it, I mean, I really has Peterson like came out and said anything other than like it was all part of the plan. No, he's like, not the, going to. You're you, because if you admit to tanking, then Roger Goodell is going to be knocking at your door and wanting draft picks. Um, yeah. Yeah, the only way that I would advocate for tanking is if you're a team that both needs a new quarterback and a new coach. Because Mm -hmm. by, say, for example, this draft, if you're the Jets and you tank and get the number one overall pick, you're going to can your coaching staff anyway. Every single one of those guys is going to be gone. Half the Mm -hmm. roster is going to be gone over half the roster in two years. So by tanking, you get a in theory you have a more attractive head coaching landing spot which will impact your organization for years to come in this situation you move up three spots but you may have impacted your organization for years to come 
in 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 a way that you did not see coming, a way that you cannot account for, a way that does not show up on a stat sheet. And this is why I what I think the big problem with the Eagles may have been, which was their ally to start, but has now become their biggest, and that is the data analytics. This team is a team that's on the forefront of data analytics. But I've seen countless times this season where they go for it in in apparently higher percentage to win chances, but you've only won four games. Mm -hmm. Don't give me this. Maybe in the long run, but this is a season-to-season league. This is a game-to-game league. You make decisions to win football games. I don't care about 100 simulations. Winning, going for it on fourth and five against one of the league's top pass defenses with your offense, your terrible offensive line, their top six in pressures allowed per drop back. You have a quarterback who's played three games. You have a slew of receivers that are dog shit. Quez Watkins, J.J. Yeah. Arcega Whiteside, John Hightower, a bunch of nobodies. And the, like, is the computer taking this into account? And at the same time, if we talk about the tank in general, yeah, the computer sees the value in moving up in slots. It's going to point to that same Jimmy Johnson trade chart and say, hey, we just gained a, a late second round pick from this. Like, why wouldn't we do it? Well, is your algorithm taking into account the trust that you may have lost with your players? With the yeah. potential guys like Jason Kelsey, maybe not even coming back? Guy, like, yeah. And it's not just the last game. So, sorry, Steve, real quick. It, it's not just that last game it, is what I want people to understand. It's not just what happened on Sunday. It's the entire season and then what happened last Sunday. It would be different if this team – you know, with seven and nine, eight and eight, and maybe the NFC was just really good. And you know what they said? Or and Jalen Hurts was playing lights out, and you knew you had a guy in him, and you said, you know, we wanted to play Nate Sudfeld. Okay, I can see it. You are a team that has had no success this season. You have had no shining light. The players have been through hell this year with all of the Eagles fans, and then you end it on this. That is the problem. And that does not show up in your damn computer algorithms. That does not show up in your data analytics. And that's what the Eagles need to get through your head. The data analytics is a tool, not the end-all, be-all. And looking at these past drafts, looking at some of these decisions, I think they're using the data analytics as an end-all. And I also don't think it's all on Doug Peterson. I think that Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie have their hand in this pot stirring it, and it's at the expense of Doug Peterson and the players. Yeah. I mean, that's right about data analytics, though. It doesn't take in a part of, like, emotions, you know? Like, and I, I'm still a true believer. Like, yeah, I, I like data analytics, and I get it. And they can help you win ball games to an extent, but at the end of the day, I still truly believe players win you ball games. And if you're like scouting these play, like, I mean, if you just have had no recent res- like good results in the draft, maybe besides Jalen Hurts and books at not Alan Rieger yet either, but and Sanders, you got to give him credit. And, and, and Sanders. Sanders, and Sanders, but like. You know, you, you look at it and you're just missing like almost every receiver. You're not getting anything on the defense. And it's just like, at what point do you just say, hey, maybe this is a flawed system and we just get some scouts in here. We go to the combine, we look at film and we just pick players that we like, not what the computer likes, you know, like it, it's got to be some given pool here now. Like, trust me, like some analytics is good, like matchup wise and this player, like does better in this scheme fit because blah, 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 this. But I think they need to really take a step back from the analytic, but that, that's just maybe who they are. They're trying to go on like full on money ball Oakland A's this shit. Like you go, go right ahead. But I think you're right about the upper management playing a part in this. Um, I think upper management holds a lot more over teams than some, like some owners and whatever. It's like, okay, I'll get the coach. And then it's like, you're kind of gig from this. But now I'm thinking, like, maybe the Eagles, like, not 
actually, but like held like a gun, not actually held a gun to Doug Peters in the head, but just like the saying, saying like, you do this, like there's repercussions if you win this game, you know, make it look competitive for a while, put in Sudfield and lose the game. And I, I could easily see them say something like that. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, I, I like you. I like data analytics. I'm actually trying to learn it right now, <laughs> um, which is kind of ironic. It's just, there's there's never a steadfast rule for something like the draft. You know, you're like you said, these are humans, not just football players. At the end of the day, there's no computer that is able to fully take that into it now. Yeah. And until then, the data analytics are a tool. Once you think that you're smarter than everyone else and that you have something figured out that everyone else doesn't, you may it's need to look beat. in the mirror. Yeah, because everyone, be like the coaches say, everyone's got a pencil. You know, and that basically means when you figure something out, everyone else can figure something out too. Everyone's got a pencil. It's the same thing for management and for data analytics and all that jazz. Everyone's got a I mean, damn computer nowadays. Yeah, that's uh, a let's good move point on. Too. Let's, let's move on. Over under results. Over under results. Boom, boom, um, boom. Over under results are in from the beginning of the season. Me and Steed, we did a lot better than I was expecting, to be completely honest. Um, I thought. Yeah. That- well, I was then, sitting there like during like the like at the end of Sunday, and I was like remember over unders, and I was like, dude, I'm pretty sure I took the over on that team, and I'm thinking that hit, you know, like I'm like I got to the fill, and I'm like, I think we did pretty good like this. We're gonna have to check the records, but it turns out we did pretty well. The only division I know I did well on was AFC East. I thought that I was gonna be hanging around 500, so. Um, Steed ended up going overall 18, 12, and 2 with 11 and 5 in the AFC, 7, 7, and 2 in the NFC. I ended up going somehow 28 or 21, 8, and 2. Um, and if you're an astute math person, you'll realize that only adds up to 31 and not 32. I forgot to pick the Seahawks. I, I yeah, never gave a pick for the, the Seahawks. Seahawks. You said screw the Seahawks. Um, yeah, we. I said screw the Seahawks. So I have 31, Steve is 32. Did not mean for that to happen. Um, I somehow went 13 and three in the AFC, eight five and two in the NFC. So just based off of that, obviously the AFC went a lot more according to plan compared mm-hmm. to the NFC. Um, so just looking at some of the highlights and teams that we were the most right on overall, our best. Our best division was the AFC North. I was the only person to get a pick wrong for the both of us in the AFC North by taking the over on the Ravens instead of the under. Me and Steed both took the over on the Steelers, Browns, and under on the Bengals, which all hit. Steed took the under on the Ravens to go 4-0, and me going 3-1. and Steed, do you want to have any final thoughts on the AFC North and – why you were thinking what you were thinking in the beginning of the season. So I know your team plays in a division, but I know your division better than you. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, <laughs> I just like it. Um, so, uh, well, the Ravens one was at 11 and a half and that really could have gone either way. They just ran into that little like rough spell, you know, but, and especially they had the COVID crisis. So you got to take that into account, but you know, the Ravens, I felt like, would just fall a tick under and wouldn't – like, teams would figure out their offense, and you saw that, like, in the middle part of the season. Uh, you know, I was always huge on the Browns coming this season. Uh, Steelers, um, well, I just saw, like, that was a great value pick right there. You know, you get Big Ben back, you had the defense coming back, and then the Bengals because the Bengals suck. And I felt like that was one of the more easier, to sit, like, divisions to pick. Because, like, it was just that one team with the Ravens. Are they going to, like, stay, like, a top a beast? And they're still a beast team. But, like, you know, are they going to fall a little bit? And that's about it. Yeah, so just going through the list, the teams that we agreed on that we were the most right were the Bills, first off. We both thought that the Bills would overtake this division. But I think that was kind of a consensus argument. Their over-under was yeah. only nine, which looking back is really low. Um, 
I wish I threw like ten thousand dollars on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were both right on the Chargers. We both took the under of eight on the Chargers. They missed it by one game, but our reasoning was correct. We knew that this team was just going to charger it out. Um, mm-hmm. Anthony Lynn, we had as a bottom half of the league head coach when we ranked our coaches, and it looks to be correct as he was just canned. Um, and we knew that this team, their depth was going to come in and bite them in the ass. They always, every year, have a great roster on paper, but once they have a couple guys go down here and there, they they aren't they able to do that next man up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the Jaguars, we were both correct on. We both had them picked for the number one overall pick while they were the favorite. It ended up happening, so you can't say that we were wrong there. Um, they gave Titans, us a scare. We, we won. Over. Yeah, they did give us a scare, but we, we stayed one. strong. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. And then um, probably the, t- the, the two teams that we were the most correct on were the Rams over eight and a half. I know a lot of people weren't very high on the Rams coming into the season saying, you know, they struggled last year. They don't, the, the division just got better this year. Uh, we both had them as a playoff team again. We both thought, mm-hmm. okay, Rams, they're going back to the playoffs. We don't care about the division. They did. And the Washington football team hit their over of one. five. It's a low over under, but every single over under, under six, six wins or under, we took the under, except for the Washington football team. We were correct on every single team with an over under of six or below. Washington football I, team win, won the division, baby. Let's go, everybody. <laughs> yeah, every, everybody called us crazy. Like, we were just sitting there and be like, why are we kind of high on this football team right now? Like, why why are we picking the over? We're like, this is going to come back and buy us somehow. But actually, it turns out they win the division. They're playing uh, they play on Saturday or Sunday. I think on oh, Sunday but, against, the, against the Tom Brady Buccaneers. That's going to be an interesting one. But no, did they get the Nickelodeon game? I don't, I, dude. I, I don't even know about. I don't even want to look at that Nickelodeon game full crap. I don't want to even think about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we kind of hit the nail on the head with the Washington football team. We both realized coming in that their offense was going to be terrible. We actually joked around about the fact of. Alex Smith coming back and saving the team for the playoffs, which ended up happening, which is hilarious. Um, We're from the future. But we both saw you as the Falcons fan with the Panthers in your division and just me as a Riverboat Ron fan. What Ron Rivera is able to do when he gets a team with a good defense, he's able to just scrap and claw his way to winning football games, which he was able to do with this football team. And, not that we were saying that the football team is going to make the playoffs. We just thought, hey, five is too low for this football team. They have too much mm-hmm. talent to to be over under five. Yeah, their offense sucks, but that defense is elite. So let's go on to the teams we were the most wrong on. The first one is the Broncos. We both hit yeah. the over of seven and a half on the Broncos. We took the bait. We bought into the Broncos hype. Um. I regret that, dude. I was. I, I was regret it too. On the fence, an awesome and then I. Uh, I should have known that wasn't going to hit. You know, I was just thinking. You got Vic Fangio, a guy that I saw what he was able to do with that defense in in Chicago, um, which you saw the Broncos still had a good defense this year, even without Von Miller, Bradley Chubb, and and some other talented pieces does. for parts of the season. What's up? I was gonna, I was gonna give us a little bit of slack because, like you know, <laughs> they lost a good chunk of their players and they didn't have Drew Lock for a while. But this Broncos team still competed week in, week out. Like if you bet on the Broncos this year, you made money. So I think it fully helped. Like I think we would have hit there. Yeah, they were one of the best teams against the spread, surprisingly. But um, the offensive struggles were just too much for this team to overcome up until about late in the season, where their offense started to go off. Um, just clearly the Broncos did not have the pieces on top of the fact that Vic Fangio needs to figure out how to manage the end of it. Um, it, it was ridiculous. I, 
we were joking about it before the episode saying we we need to sit Vic Fangio down in front of an Xbox and play some Madden to, to practice some time management scenarios because Jesus Christ, he legitimately threw games with his clock and game management. So he needs to get that, get that to an NFL level. If he oh, wants yeah. to stay the head coach of the football team, because he's already on the hot seat after year one. And rightfully so. I, You know, whether or not you have injuries, there are plenty of teams that have injuries. It's not necessarily a huge excuse. But he should be kept around for another year. It's going to be interesting to see what they do in the draft and whether or not they want a quarterback scenario or they will die on the Drew Lock Hill. Let's see, other teams that we were wrong on. Eagles over 9.5, we were definitely very wrong on. Kind of like we alluded to in the last segment, it's just, we both like the team coming in. We like the organization. They were the only team with a returning head coach in a COVID year, which I thought would have a much bigger impact than it ended up having. Um, just because and it's not like the other teams, we didn't predict the, their seasons to go the way we took the under on the Cowboys. We took the over on the football team. Giants pushed, so it doesn't matter. But we, we all knew what was going to happen with those teams. They were going to start off slow because they had to learn new systems with no offseason. And then as the season progresses, get a little bit hot, right? We, we knew mm-hmm. that was going to happen. And it did. You know, first like seven weeks of the season, the entire NFC East was dog crap. And then they started finally winning football games. But the Eagles, not only were they just bad, they never got hot. They never figured it out. They they were never in a good stretch of games, which we were wildly wrong on. Uh, yeah. Vikings, we were really wrong. We took their over of nine. They were a team that just started off really slow. They started off like, what, one in five, one in six? Yeah, they and, started off one in five and turned it on late. Yeah, they turned it on late. It's just a little bit too much to overcome, especially with their lack of defense now. Their defense is clearly mm-hmm. an issue. Um, 49ers, we both took the over on. I'll cut us some slack just because of the amount of injuries and turmoil that the 49ers have had to undergo. Like, you know, the Packers game, they had to play with basically less than half of their players, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) their starters. It's ridiculous. Um, and then the Falcons bait. We took the Falcons. (sighs) Yeah. Story as old as time. (laughs) You just gotta laugh that one off. (laughs) Yeah, over seven and a half. You're looking at that team. Matt Ryan. Dan, this is a team that was in the Super Bowl a couple years ago. It's only seven and a half. They can. Yeah, then the the day you got to remember it's Dirk Cutter and the boys. You know, real quick, going back to the to the Eagles. I, I, we didn't mention this on the Eagles segment, but are the Eagles the new Falcons? You know? Through their first five seasons, Dan Quinn had a higher win percentage than Doug Peterson. Um, or for the fir- through their first five seasons, not five, five games. They both made it to a Super Bowl. I mean, the Falcons lost and the Eagles won. But just are the Eagles the Falcons that happened to win the Super Bowl? That's a question that you may hear in the future. But you got anything else to say on the over-unders? Any teams that you thought in particular that you hit the nail on the head? Well... Uh, I mean, no, I think we said we need uh, – I've already said, like, how much I like Browns and Bills coming in. And then I took the over on the Chiefs, right? Yeah, because yeah. I felt like the Chiefs Both were did. just like – Yeah, like, what was that at? It was like 12 and a half, wasn't half. it? It was – Oh, it was, okay, that, that's why I liked it. I was like, dude, you telling me they're not winning 12 games, the Chiefs? <laughs> yeah, I was definitely more skeptical than you were. It's just you're right. Like, looking back. 11 and a half is really low. The, the thing is, is that people thought that the Ravens were going to be insane. Uh, the super dog? Like, See, like 14 and that's, 2 kind of insane. I, I always, that's what I love about the NFL is because like people like come into the new season and just think it's like going to be the same teams that compete. I mean, we've seen the Bills take an extra step. We've seen the Browns get back to the playoffs. We've seen the Steelers, you know, be very, I mean, at one time the Steelers were undefeated. So like, and it will be the same all same next year. They're going to be like, well, the Bills are legit. And then, you know, the Bills could go 10 and 6 and struggle because teams figure them out, you know. But mm-hmm. that's uh, all I got to say on the over-unders. 
Another interesting thing, we were two and one combined on teams that we switched right before the season. We had a thing mm. so that we took all the over right before the season. We gave ourselves the ability to switch a couple of picks um, if we wanted to. What, you know, And we had to take it at the current line at the time. It's not like we could just switch it and take the line back in time. You had to, if you were to switch, you were switched to what Vegas was currently predicting their season over-unders. For the three teams that we switched, their over-unders did not change from the time that we picked them, actually, which is kind of funny. Um, you switched the to the under on the Cowboys and the one. I switched my under on the Steelers to an over on the Steelers, which I'm really happy I did. I would not be yeah. able to live with myself taking Go, the under. Start 11 to 0. Just feel like, Jesus, <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> yeah, what have I done? Um, I guess me in particular, teams that I think I really hit the nail on the head, the Patriots, I think that yeah, that's a good call. that was a team – I think I was a little bit higher on them being, but I, I was just thinking, hey, this is a team we see the lack of talent. We know that they're going to win a couple games they're not supposed to, and we know they're going to lose a couple games that they're supposed to win. Um, I thought that I had them pegged as a 7-9, 8-8 nine, eight eight team. They ended up, what, going? 7-9. Okay, so I, I guess I was more right then. I thought they went 6-10 and 10 for some reason. Dude, um, hold on. The, about the Patriots, don't mean to cut you off. You know, it, it, how many COVID people they get out there and Cam not being good and how bad the offense was and how many coaches other than Belichick can still put them around that 500 mark and be out of the playoffs until like week 16? You know, that's just not a crazy lot. to me. Not yeah, a lot. that's crazy. Um, yeah, you're right. I don't think Belichick gets it. The fact of the matter I give him a ton of credit for that. That team was terrible. Yeah, they like, were garbage. The, the, the team was awful. You know, like the, the secondary is great, but I think we kind of knew what was going to happen. I had said coming into the season, I think this is a team like a couple years ago when their offense started struggling. We're going to see them go back to the power run, which at, at first mm-hmm. they were kind of airing the ball out a little bit, using Cam in a bunch of ways. But when you saw that Cam, Cam did a little bad. Um, Damian Harris and the power run game with those classic Patriot double teams on the interior started really showing up. Yeah, I just think you're right. With the amount of personnel inconsistency between the opt-outs and then guys getting injured in the season and then, you know, draft picks not necessarily developing and stepping up, that was a it was just tough-ass coaching job. It, yeah, it was just too much at the end of the day, you know. You just don't have enough. And I think you're right. The fact that they won seven games, I think the Patriots fans should realize that is really impressive. And, and some of the wins, too, right? That win against the Chargers where you decimate them. A great mm-hmm. win against the Cardinals. A great win yeah. against the Ravens. Like, they had some really quality wins. You know, yeah, you had some annoying losses, but I think that you need to take the positives, and I think we need to realize that the Patriots are probably not going to be that poor in talent next season and, and seasons after if they still have Belichick around. Um, yeah, no. Real quick, I think a team you were good on, let's just start speed running these. Raiders, you hit the over. Good on you because I hit the under even though I like the one year. I thought they were one year away, which it ended up kind of being. But they hit the over, so you you can't deny results. Um, Yeah. The Colts, I was really high on coming into the season. Mm -hmm. They were kind of what we expected them to be even after a rough start. Um, Who else? I think that's about it. We both took the over on the Cardinals. I. Over under seven of the Cardinals is just low. Um, and I yeah, guess I took the was... over of the Bucks. I bought into the GOAT and, and the Brady mm-hmm. night. Yeah, because at the beginning of the year, I didn't like that team. I like them a lot now. I think they can make a run, but I mean, I should have never challenged the GOAT. That's on me. I have one rule in life, and that is you never doubt the GOAT. So, But you doubted the – yeah, true, yeah, yeah. Uh, Listen, I have sometimes bro- broken that rule, and I'm ashamed of myself. I came up with it when I was young, when every single season, the freaking Patriots with Tom Brady and the Colts with Peyton Manning would beat my Steelers to the ground. And I remember the Colts had a crazy comeback one year to beat us with Peyton Manning. And I was like, "Listen, these guys are too good. I'm not doubting them. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're just gonna be a, a sad person if you do it." All right, 
Mm-hmm. So, last segment of the episode, we are going to be doing our first mock draft. Um, now, this is a mock draft where we're only doing the first 18 teams. I just hate doing mock drafts where it's like, oh, well, with the position this team would be in. No, no, no. Like, we're doing it with the position we think they're in. This is just the first one. It's kind of an introductory mock draft where we, we did no trades. We're going to come out with mock drafts in the future that go further down in the draft and have trades and all that jazz. But it's just the first one. We haven't watched a lot of these prospects either, so don't murder us too much. But um, let's just get the first pick out of the way. The Jaguars take Trevor Lawrence. Unsurprised. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay, now let's start the mock draft at pick two. <laughs> Steed, why don't you go first? Who do you have the Jets selecting pick two? So, like, I'm between two players, and I got Justin Fields here. At the end of the day, I think they're just going to go with quarterback, and I think that's the Jets thing to do. Because consensus, I think the fans are going to want a quarterback, and the way Fields has performed in his college career, and especially against Clemson, against Trevor Lawrence Clemson, and lit it up, really opened up some eyes. And, you know, I, I was looking at it, do you you could just try to trade out Sam Darnold and you know because you would have to pay him money and I think as a head coaching job if you want a good head coach and he could look at it and be like okay I'm I won't field just give me my quarterback at the end of the day so I I got field slotted here. I also have Justin Field slotted here. I would not be terribly surprised if Zach Wilson or even Trey Lance went here, depending on how these guys start progressing in the process and what guys like between all. I'm personally someone that has the gap between Fields, Wilson, and Trey Lance razor thin. Um, they all do mm-hmm. th- like. They're all somewhat similar quarterbacks. Uh, you know, they're kind of that prototypical modern type of quarterback where they can both run and throw. None of these guys have bad arms. It's not like arm strength is necessarily an issue for any one of these guys. I'm much more confident in the arm strength of Fields and um, and Trey Lance than I am with Zach Wilson, but I also haven't completed my analysis, which includes, you know, his accurate range and his throwing power. So I have the Jets also selecting Fields for now. um, I think it's safe. You look at Fields, he's he's, he's definitely one of the most quarterbacks in the class. Um, While he does, I I have some issues with, you know, how he goes through his progressions like other people do. And um, and the fact of the matter is, is that he's not forced to make difficult throws. I think that he could speed up his process a little bit. And he does hold on to the ball too long. But we have seen guys from college fix these issues. People like Deshaun Watson. And, you know, there's a whole long list of them that are able to fix these issues. I think they're being overblown comparing him to to Dwayne Haskins. Dwayne Haskins is nowhere near as much of an athlete as Justin Fields. And Justin Fields' deep ball is top-notch. The guy is incredibly accurate. Beautiful. And due to his accuracy, we saw Baker Mayfield go number one because of it. I think that Justin Fields should be selected number two due to his accuracy, whether or not you like the quarterbacks behind him. It's just kind of the way the news goes. Yeah. Uh, Oh, real quick, though, real quick, real quick. Before we move on from the Jets, you are completely right. I could see them taking Sewell or even trading down a handful of spots, maybe with, like, the Falcons if they want a quarterback, the Falcons straight up too. And, um, and they go at four and take Sewell. Because you look at the Jets, I don't understand why people are thinking their offensive line is solved and that the guy, they, Mekhi Becton, they drafted last year is should have been like an all-pro this year. He's good. He has a ton of potential. He's had some great reps. But he was not a Pro Bowl-level tackle this year. I don't know where this narrative came from. I, I, I don't understand it. If you look at games like the Raiders game, and pretty much, you know, I went back during my Sam Darnold house. I haven't watched every Jets game because I did it during the season. So those games after the analysis, I didn't watch. But from basically week one until week 11, he was not an all-pro caliber tackle. He was good, mm-hmm. and he has a ton of potential. But he is not a stud. He has all the potential in the world and could develop into a stud. 
But can we please stop saying that Mekhi Becton, day one, wasn't he wasn't even the best tackle day one in his draft class, let alone the NFL. Stop this narrative. It is absurd. The Jets are third most in pressures per dropback, tied for second with the Vikings at 27.6% uh, of dropbacks. Their quarterback is pressured. They're one of the top teams in quarterback hits. Um, it's just stop this narrative that the, the, the Jets offensive line is great. Like they have so many holes. And left tackle is still a hole. You cannot be inconsistent at left tackle. So I would not be surprised if they go Sewell. But let's move on to pick three with the Dolphins. Who do you got? So it's interesting with the Dolphins here, too, because I think they're in that position to trade out. But if we're just picking straight up, I'm going to have them pick in just Sewell here. I think uh, they could easily go receiver here, which they desperately need for Tua. But – you know, you took an offensive lineman last year in the first round, Austin Jackson. He played very well. Their O line performed very well this season, was a big part of their huge success. But, you know, very so do you get just an automatic, like, lock of a beast as Sewell. You know, this is a guy who got a second place Heisman vote. An offensive lineman got a second place Heisman vote. So I think you just take the sure pick here and get you a anchor on your offensive line for years to help protect Tua. And, you know, hopefully in the later on the first round, because they still have first round and a ton more picks, you know, you could just carve your way and find some good weapons for them. So I do agree that I could see the Dolphins take Sewell just because of the talent that he has. And like you, like you said, I think he's also just a surefire stud. I have the Dolphins taking Devontae Smith. I think that Devontae Smith is uh, another surefire stud type of prospect. He was a guy that um, last season when I was grading the receivers, I instantly put a first round grade on him because, you know, he just, when you had a team with Judy and, and Ruggs and even Waddle a little bit, he didn't play as much as Devontae and those other guys. Devontae Smith, you can argue, was the best receiver on the field even last year. This year, he has completely lit up the league. I'm kind of a little bit pissed because I wanted to target him in my dynasty leagues, but now I'm not going to be picking that high to be able to get him. Um, I have the, you know, to me, the Dolphins, what they miss, they need verticality on their offense with their weapons. The only guys, and you just look at Tua, right? Tua is a guy that he needs to be able to stretch defenses. The only guy that he's been able to consistently stretch defenses with is Mike Gusecki. Devontae Parker, with his health and his play this year, has been way too inconsistent to rely on as a number one. Not saying that he doesn't have the talent. It's just at the end of the day, he wasn't there enough. So mm -hmm. getting someone like Devontae Smith, someone who I believe is the best overall deep threat receiver, um, not necessarily as just the best deep threat, but like, he is a great deep threat receiver. Plus, he's really good at, like, everything else. So yeah. give me Devontae Smith at three. This is, like I was telling you earlier on the podcast, probably the best top two receivers in Devontae Smith and Jamar Chase since that Julio A.J. Green class. And I'm not just throwing that around. Like, other people have thrown that around before. I have – that Julio A.J. Green, Julio has been my favorite receiver prospect I've ever looked at. These are the only two receivers in recent times that match that type of grade. I don't care about yeah, last totally year agree. and years before and all that shit. This is the first year. So give me Devontae Smith. I need a receiver. All right, I your like boys. That. Yeah, Falcons, uh, uh, Matt Ryan, if you're listening to this, bro, is nothing against you, everything you've done. But I just know a new coach, new GM, they're going to want to go some different kind of way. I got him picking Zach Wilson. I kind of want Zach Wilson. I, I kind of I want Zach Wilson just because I I see in the league now all these quarterbacks have these playmaking abilities, running around pocket, making plays. You know, Matt, it, it, if you want a definition of a pocket passer, it's Matt Ryan. That dude cannot move to save his life and take sacks left and right. You know, so give me Zach Wilson. Give me the talent from BYU and. It, it, it's just dawn of a new era. It's time to start over, you know. Give me a new franchise guy, and I think you have that in Zach Wilson, and that's who I'm picking. 
All right, so for me at four, I also have the, t- the Falcons taking a quarterback, but I have them taking Trey Lance. And this is not because I like Trey Lance more than I like Zach Wilson. I do really like Zach Wilson, but I also like Trey Lance. The reason I have Trey Lance going here is because we have seen the past couple of drafts, the quarterback with the best physical traits, if you're able to develop him, becomes an absolute stud. To me, aside from Lawrence, and even including Lawrence, Trey Lance is the best prospect in, with the overall package. If, if, you t- if you take all the bull crap away, you know, accuracy and all that shit, arm talent plus legs, you know, mo- mobility, Trey Lance is that guy. The guy's got a cannon, and he is really good with the football in his hands. He can break a lot of tackles. So with that, I think the Falcons decide to go with a new GM. They decide to go a little ballsy. They decide, hey, if if I'm sitting him under Matt Ryan, I want a guy that has a little bit more potential and is a little bit more of a project. So they go Trey Lance at four for me. I mean, I would like that too. I'm just – Speaking on behalf of the other stupid ass Falcons fans, they're just going to hate that. <laughs> oh yeah, and there is something to be said that you know, getting Trey Lance, not, not Trey Lance, um, Zach Wilson in that dome. Um, you're right, he's got the legs. He's just he's a playmaker, and we've seen you know the last playmaker they had, they had Vic. Vic was just great for them. So um, getting Zach Wilson would still be phenomenal. I need to finish my analysis to really have one guy over the other. It's just. We, we look at recent history. This is a copycat league. I think that Trey Lance is being a little underrated because, mm-hmm. you know, he's not as flashy and as consistent as the other guys. But you look at the raw talent, he's up there. Yeah. Uh, so next pick I got at five. I got the Bungles taking old Jamar Chase. I, see, I, I, I agree with you that with the Chase and Devontae Smith, these are two top-tier receivers and the reason why I, I just like Chase a little more than Devontae just because I think he's he's got the stronger hands and more like go up and get it as no slouch on Devontae because I truly think he's the better route runner and getting off the ball. But I for some reason Jamar Chase I still like his game a little more and I think if you put him aside Joe Burrow and I know they have already a pretty you know, talented receiver room and T Higgins, Tyler Boyd, and list goes on and on. But if you're able to put up Jamar Chase, a number one receiver, that offense could do good things. I know they still have to protect Burrow, and hopefully they can figure that out later in the draft. But if you get a surefire receiver right here to go along Burrow, I think that makes him really happy. And I think you get a lot of good things moving forward. Yeah, you're right. I think it's a fair argument to have Chase over Devontae Smith. I had Chase over Devontae Smith earlier in the season, like coming into this season. Um, I think that I had it a little bit closer than people initially. Now you see having Devontae Smith over Chase, which I think is is fine. My whole thing is I, I had the Dolphins taking him at three just because I think he fits the system better than Jamar Chase. But um, I've got Cincinnati getting one of the better value picks in this draft with Panay Sewell at five. In a mock draft with trades and in the future with free agency, I don't think the Penny Sewell is going to make it to five. I don't think that the, my, my mock draft is going to play out as cleanly as this one is because we have a whole lot more of the process to go. But for now, we've got these quarterbacks going. I think these receivers are going to be going a little bit earlier than other people anticipate So, like compared to previous drafts. So Cincinnati gets one of the biggest steals of this draft at pick five with Penny Sewell. I like that. Now here comes the sixth pick. The pick that, you know, for the tank, it the better curse. be worth it. Yeah, <laughs> it better be worth it. The Eagles have to hit on this pick. And I think you hit by taking Devontae Smith. You take the Heisman winner. Another surefire receiver. I know they have had problems with picking receivers in a half, but if Rager can stay healthy and figure it out, you know, Devontae Smith is a good number one, good a good um to go beside him and I think they can start figuring things out and hopefully you know I feel like if you're going to spend a six pick you would take just one of the better players in the draft yeah I completely agree and I have the thing um they miss out just this month just narrowly on Penny Sewell so I have them taking Jamar Chase who I think fits them better than Devontae Smith 
guy. Our chase. You finally get the guy that I've been saying the Eagles need for years now. I wanted them. Now, this is also kind of a hindsight 2020 thing. Last year, I wanted the Eagles to take Justin Jefferson. Not because I thought that Justin Jefferson was going to start lighting up the league. I just had Justin Jefferson as a guy that I didn't see him drop a pass when I did my film analysis. I didn't watch every mm -hmm. single one of his games. I only watched like, I think, seven, seven or six. But I did not see him drop a single pass. Every other receiver dropped one except for um, Justin Jefferson. You finally get a guy, like you said, that has great hands. I'm tired, if I'm an Eagles fan, of my damn receivers dropping footballs. Take yeah. someone who cares about the numbers and the stats and the, and the measurables and all that. I just want someone that won't drop the fucking ball. So I'll take Jamar Chase. Don't drop the ball. Yeah, please don't. Uh, <laughs> and, but I wonder if, like, you know, coming draft time, because Jamar Chase sat out this year, so he hasn't seen game action since the Natty. You know, I don't think it's a fault on him at all. Honestly, he'd be more healthy and not have as much um, miles on him as Devontae Smith. But, you know, like – I could see Jamar Chase, once he gets in the league, you know, struggle just a little bit because, you know, he hasn't seen game action. But at the end of the day, I, I think he's a hit. Um, yeah, as long as he hasn't been sitting around eating Doritos. Yeah, true. He could be doing that. But um, right, Lions. Lions at seven. So I got Lions taking quarterback. I got them taking Trey Lance here. And I think this is interesting because – you know, new management, new coach, like we said with the Falcons, they probably want to want to go a different way. But is they 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 could keep Matthew Stafford for another year maybe and just have Trey Lance play under him because I, I too don't think Trey Lance is way, ready to play week one, but his raw talent can't be not denied. So I think he could be a good stepping stone for this new uh, regime that's coming in Detroit. Okay, I also have the Lions team back but we just flip-flopped them i have them taking zach wilson um you know detroit needs a guy that can carry them i think it's pretty mm -hmm. evident right now you're you might be able to get that in zach wilson so zach wilson while i think that in a draft with trades we may see a little bit of trade action going on for a team to go up and get one of these trey lances or zach wilson's especially if a team like the Falcons, the Bengals, or the Dolphins are open to offers, uh, maybe even the Jets. Um, I think that we could see a team jump at someone like the Lions for the quarterback. But for now, yeah. we ha I have him, Zach Wilson. Who you got the Panthers at? At eight. I got, at eight. I got him taking Kyle Pitts. Um, I, I think this is a certified beast. This dude is going to be a beast of tight end in the league. You know, uh, Robbie Anderson and Curtis Samuel are both going to be free agents, and they're going to need something to, like, replace them. And what better? Like, dude, he's not just a natural tight end. This guy is fast. He's he's a mismatch for linebackers and safeties. So he can really do it all. Now, the Panthers could uh, – they probably – they need a quarterback too. But, like, you know, you could kind of ride with Teddy Bridgewater and just take the best player available in which is, I think, is Kyle Pitts. Okay, I have a similar theory with the Panthers best player available. My thing, though, is that just looking at Joe Brady's past offenses at LSU with um, with Carolina, I just didn't see a whole lot of use of the tight ends. You know, at LSU, we didn't see Thaddeus Moss as necessarily a premier tight end. He was they, they would be used, but not as like an offense that runs through a tight end. So my BPA for the Panthers is Micah Parsons. You get to replace Luke Keekley, who you lost a couple seasons ago, one of the best linebackers in the league, with the top linebacker prospect. I've watched a little bit of Micah Parsons. This guy is a beast. I think he's great for the modern game in terms of he can go sideline to sideline as a middle linebacker, and getting him at eight is a great pick for the Panthers in that defense. I like that. Um, so for the Broncos at nine, I got him taking Michael Parsons too. Uh, I think you just take the best player available here. I mean, they need a little bit of a linebacker, and I think that would be would just unbelievable for them. If yeah, and it, it's a lot to say because Michael Parsons could – 
go as I, he could go to the Falcons at four too. Like he, he, he could go, go anywhere in this draft. Like yeah, yeah he, like he, he could. Uh, he could go to a whole lot of teams, but if the Broncos are. I got him slotted to take Micah Parsons. They get him. He's going to be instant beast on that. At a fully healthy Broncos defense is scary, and they can make some noise with that pick. Yeah, all right. So at nine, I have the Broncos going Patrick Sertain, that corner from Alabama. Um, I wasn't very confident in this mock for the Broncos because, um, you know, I was thinking of having them take that Elijah Vera Tucker, that tackle, you know, maybe uh, Quidi Paye, uh, an interior D lineman. Um, for me, if I'm the Broncos general manager, I am shoring up my offensive line. I just wasn't very confident in, in a lot of these offensive line prospects at this point in my process. So for now, I'm just going to go best player available. And for me, that was Patrick Sertain from Alabama. All right. Uh, so the Cowboys are picking at 10. I got them taking Queedy Pay, that uh, DN from Michigan. I mean, it, the story's out on the Cowboys. They need talent on the defense. Yeah. And I think <laughs> the guy, yeah. he, he started, what, one year at Michigan, I'm pretty sure, but he's rising fast. I mean, he might even, with the combine come out, he might even eke in more in the top, more in the uh, upper in the round. But I think uh, if they fall, if he falls to him, it's a great pick. A guy that can start day one and bring some kind of talent to this detriment of the defense. Yeah, I've got the Cowboys also going Quiddy Pay, Paye. Um, I just think he's a guy that's going to light up the combine. And, you know, Cowboys need defense. Uh, so, uh, so at 11, I got a Giants take a Giants take a home dog. dog. Take a home dog. Take a home dog. Holy crap, Jesus. stop. You sound like a robot. Do I? Do I? What about okay. now? What about now? No, still a robot. All right, I'll go. I'll fix your stuff. I'll go first. Um, Giants, I've got um, Kyle Pitts. Just basically going best player available. I like what I saw. Not be surprised at all if they went edge rusher. Um, yeah, I, I could easily see them taking an edge rusher here. But for me, if I'm the Giants, I want talent. Give me Kyle Pitts at pick 11. All right, Steve, you fixed? Do I still sound like a robot? Nope, you are not a robot anymore. Congratulations. Okay. Welcome back to Sweet. the living. Jesus, that was scary. Uh, so, I, like I say, I got him taking a home dog, and J.C. Horn is my first corner off the board. I think, you know, they already hit with James Bradbury. He looks like a stud of a corner, and they had a miss on DeAndre Baker. We all know what happened to him. If you're able to put J.C. Horn and James Bradbury in already a resurgent defense in New York, I think they it, it could be spelling trouble for uh, receivers. And I also really like J.C. Horn's game. Uh, he's a fast player. He's a great athlete. And watching South Carolina games like I do every Saturday, you know, he just – Teams don't throw the ball his way, you know? Like, it's just kind of like they know how good he is and they're just going to target someone else, and I think he can make an immediate impact with the Giants as well. Okay, well, speaking of J.C. Horn, I got him at pick 12 for the 49ers for a lot of the reasons you said when I watched games. Uh, when I watch South Carolina games, J.C. Horn is the best defensive player on the field. He's got a lot, a lot of potential, and I also think that he's very polished – for a corner, and this is coming from a school that has a great track record with defensive backs. So give me J.C. Yeah, Horn at pick 12. Um, so at pick 12, I'm going corner two for the 49ers. I'm going to Sertain. Uh, I mean, basically same reasons why you took Sertain earlier. I had this dude, uh, 6'2 corner, physical, be able to bully – receivers up front i bama you know like anytime you take a bama player you're pretty much going to hit so and uh, you know plus on the 49ers front uh, sherman jason very are going to be a uh, free agent so they're going to need to have a little bit of help in the secondary okay so for the Chargers at pick 13 yeah 13 i've got them going elijah Vera. Give me the best offensive lineman on the board. And um, 
this is solely, you know, you, this is a team that we just got our franchise quarterback. I want to protect him. Um, mm -hmm. Chargers were a team that were tied for fourth in the league on most pressures allowed at 26.6%. I cannot be a team that can compete with a franchise quarterback without protecting him. The Chargers have never in like my lifetime, it feels like had that top quality offensive line. We're picking at 13. If, if this team is as talented and as good as we think they are, hopefully they're not picking this high again. So maybe they can, they can knock down this tackle spot and then not have to pick within the top 15 for a while. So give me Elijah Vera Tucker. Yeah, I'm taking Elijah Vera Tucker as well. Yeah, like you said, you need to protect Justin Herbert as he looks like he's the real deal. Uh, I mean, dude, books out on the Chargers, their left tackle sucks. Um, Elijah Vera Tucker doesn't suck, so you should draft him. <laughs> All right, so at pick 14, I've got the Vikings taking Gregory Rosau from Miami. Um, Vikings, this is a team that had that – whole debacle with Yannick Ngagwe where they trade for him and then they realize they're not going to compete so they trade him away for less than they got for him to the Ravens um yeah that was a that was a weird series of moves let's shore that spot up with Gregory Rosau as a as an edge rusher yeah I got him taking the edge rusher as well but I got him taking uh Christian Barrymore from Bama uh, I think, like, you know, uh, between him and Brussel, like, those are two really good players. Uh, I think they would just kind of bite into the Bama kind of committee. But, like, you know, he's got – he's very athletic and get to the quarterback. And we all know, like, the Vikings need help on defense. Like, they just do. And they need to bolster the defensive line. And I think this would be a great pick for him. Okay, so at pick fifteen, this is a really interesting one because is... we're looking at a we're looking at a Patriots team that needs a whole lot, um, mm -hmm. and without trades, this is a spot where I would not be surprised if the Patriots are not picking at fifteen, whether they're trading up or down. But I have them, especially they don't have a third round pick, I don't think this year. So I could totally see them moving down to later in the in the first round so that they can acquire more picks because I'm not sure there's one player that's going to solve the Patriots problems. But I just went best player available for offense and I'm taking Rondell Moore, wide receiver. Um Rondell Moore is currently my third receiver on the board has been for a while. This is a guy that I really 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 like. Um I have not seen very many receivers being triple teamed and quadruple teamed multiple times a game. And um, he's still able to make stuff happen. He's an overall playmaker, which is what I think the Patriots need on offense. They need someone who can create. And um, Rondell Moore is just that and more. So I'll take him at 15. Uh, so I was leaning receiver a little bit. We were making up the draft, but dude, I'm going to do it. I got them taking Mac Jones. From Bama. Uh, Belichick needs a quarterback. I think Matt Jones is a very good quarterback. He might be not in the same his skill set as a Fields or, you know, Trey Lance or Zach Wilson or all, but I think he could come in day one and start. You know, like he's not a project. I uh, he can he can move the ball around. Um so I think, I think he's Belichick, underrated arm talent too. Yeah, so I think Belichick just goes ahead. Like I, People might say that's a little bit of reach here, but at the end of the day, if it pays off, it pays off, so it doesn't matter. And I think uh, Mac Jones, I, I think he ha will have some success in the NFL regardless where he goes, but if he goes to the Patriots, I definitely think he could start week one and ha put the Patriots back in the mix. All right, so for the Cardinals, I have them. They, I could easily see them going offensive line here. But I have the Cardinals going Caleb Farley, the cornerback. Mm. It's just a great value pick. This is a guy that could be picked where J.C. Horn or um, or I had Sertain go. I think he's just as talented of a prospect. So the fact that I get that level of a prospect at pick 16, um, I think that's just a little bit too good of value for the Cardinals to pass up and they look to fill some of their offensive line issues 
or like a running back issue in agency rather than with the 16 pick of the draft. Yeah, I'm taking Caleb Farley too. Um, it's a really good corner class, especially of the top half. So, um, yeah, I think you get just a good player from Virginia Tech that can come in and instantly make an impact on a team that, you know, needs a couple things to really compete for next season. And I think he can help that defense really find its mold. Okay, so for the Raiders, I kind of have a pick here. I'm taking Zaven Collins for the Raiders, uh, linebacker out of Tulsa. This is a guy that um, I do think the Raiders might really fall in love with. He's someone that kind of plays all over the field. He can he can rush the passer. He can play inside linebacker. He's good both blitzing and in coverage. I think that this is someone that the Raiders kind of need. They need someone that can fill this little just kind of all-around versatile type of mold. Um, you know, regardless, at the end of the day, the Raiders just talent on the defensive side of the football. And I do think that Zayvon Collins is a very talented player. So I think that I can get a very versatile linebacker that can really help in all areas for this Raiders defense. So I have them reaching a little bit and taking a guy, but this is a team that has, has is not afraid to, to overpay for their guy. They do it mm-hmm. every year. So I, I'm just going to try and predict it and maybe Zayvon Collins that guy this year. I like that. Um, this is where I got Gregory Rizal going. Um, you know, you never can have enough D-line, and we know the Raiders' defense needs to be bolstered as well, as that really uh, halted their success this year, especially late. Uh, you get a tremendous pass rush, pass rusher who looks athletic. The thing is, since this is our first mock draft with no trades, I don't think Gregory Russell is going to technically be here at this point. I could see him testing very well and going earlier in this. But if they're able to snag him up, I think that's a good pick. Okay, so with the last pick in the draft, I have the Dolphins going with – hold on, I can't read this guy's name. Um, Jason Owen? Owen? Um, let me see if I can find him here. Where's he from? Yeah, Jason Oway. There it is. Jason Oway from Penn State. Um, okay. Just an edge rusher. I really did not know what to do with the Dolphins. But it was, this is a, this is a really weird pick for the Dolphins. They have a whole lot of avenues they can go. And who they pick here is going to be determined by who they go with their earlier draft pick. Because if they decide to go with Sewell at pick three, or even go with a quarterback to replace Tua, then they may go, they'll probably go with a skill player, like a receiver at pick 18. But then if they go receiver at three, they're probably not going receiver at 18. So screw it. I'll just put who I had as the best edge rusher left on the board. All right, uh, so since I had the Dolphins pick and Sewell at three, uh, like we said, they need talent around Tua. They need receivers. I'm just going to take Jalen Waddle, a guy he's very familiar with and uh, hasn't played much this year because of injury. I think he's going to play the natty, though, so that's good. But I, I think he's a tremendous receiver as well. Um, like I said, this is another receiver class that there's a lot of good players, and he could do some good things for – to in Miami. All right. Well, that's it for our mock draft. We're only doing the teams that have their draft spots set in stone when, you know, as we start moving forward in the playoffs and more teams draft spots are set, we'll release more mock drafts. And as more information comes out with pro days, senior bowls, combines, all that stuff, we'll go deeper and deeper with our mock drafts. So With that being said, that's going to be it for episode 31. If you made it this far, thank you so much for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, comment if you're feeling a little bit frisky. Um, But with that being said, thank you so much and peace out.